So with April marking the 150th anniversary of the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, I thought I'd take a minute and do a Google Earth tour so that you can follow in the footsteps of the faithful events of April 14th, 1865, along with the subsequent uh, John Wilkes Booth escape into Maryland and Virginia, so that if you ever wanted to follow along and, and do it yourself, you first you, you can. So our first stop in our tour is going to be over at the White House. On April 11th, 1865, um, the Civil War had concluded and the people were asking for Abraham Lincoln to give a speech. They had all gathered outside the White House and they were Lincoln appeared on the second floor with his wife and gave a speech. They were calling for him to address the nation and uh, he did so, but he wanted to talk a little bit about reconstruction and he talked about limited black suffrage and the people were a little actually expecting him to talk about the you know the the defeat of the south and how we were going to um, you know punish the south and those types of things but he did not speak about those types of things and he didn't want to uh, boast about their the recent victory but he addressed the spectators from the second floor and in the crowd was a gentleman by the name of John Wilkes Booth. And he listened to that speech, and when Lincoln started talking about limited suffrage for these slaves, he actually got really upset. And he said, quote, Now by God I'll put him through. That is the last speech he will ever make. John Wilkes Booth was an interesting character, and our next stop on our tour is over at the National Hotel, where Booth was actually staying. The National Hotel is located was located at the corner of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and 6th Street, several blocks from the White House. It opened in 1826, and by 1857, it had approximately 200 rooms. Besides John Wilkes Booth, this hotel has boasted other well-known individuals, such as Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, who actually died here in 1852, and the famous photographer Matthew Brady. John Wilkes Booth was staying in room 228 while plotting his assassination. The hotel was a favorite of stage performers from Ford's Theater because it was within easy walking distance. Booth ate breakfast at the hotel on the 14th and then headed to Ford's Theater to check his mail, where he learned that President Lincoln would actually be attending that evening's performance of Our American Cousin. It was also at the National Hotel that Booth was uh, meeting and talking to his fiance, his secret fiance, Lucy Hale, who was the daughter of New Hampshire Senator John Parker Hale. Our next stop will be... At Ford's Theater. Built in 1833, Ford's was originally a Baptist church. It was the first Baptist church in the District of Columbia, and it was built, but after John Ford bought it in 1861, he turned it actually into a theater. It was here at 9.30 p.m. On, the, on April 14th where John Wilkes Booth came to its rear alley, which is actually referred to as Baptist Alley, and asked the family friend and odd jobs man Ned Spangler to hold his horse. He then made his way underneath the stage to the foyer and the box office to a saloon next door. After having a few drinks, he proceeded to the front entry of Ford's and into the uh, double box where President Lincoln, Mary, and their two guests sat. At about 10.15 that night, Booth took his 44 caliber derringer and shot the president and stabbed his guest, Henry Rathbone, six times. Booth, subsequently, uh, Booth next jumped off the stage to about 12 feet catching his, the, some would say, catching his boot spur in the bunting at the stage and breaking, breaking his foot. But he yelled, got onto the stage, raised his bloody knife in his hand, and yelled, Six Semper Tyrannus, which is the Virginia state motto, which means thus always to tyrants. Up in the box, Lincoln sat hunched over with Booth's pistol bullet lodged behind his right eyeball. Dr. Charles Leal, a guest at the theater that night and fervent Lincoln fan, proceeded to Lincoln's box. Henry Bathbone, awakened from Booth's attack, removed the music stand Booth had placed under the door and let Dr. Leal attend to the now uh, dying Lincoln. He pronounced Lincoln mortally wounded and decided that he should be moved to a more appropriate place of death. But the White House was about a mile away, which was too far, and Lincoln would not survive the journey. So Dr. Leal and a team of his men moved the president, whose death was imminent, to the house across the street owned by Mr. Peterson. Next up on our tour is Mary Surratt's Boarding House. Mary Surratt's Boarding House is located at 541 H Street and has served as the residence for Mary Surratt and her boarders. Her son John Surratt was not present at the time of the assassination of President Lincoln as he was in Elmira, New York. 
John Wilkes Booth was a frequent visitor to the Surratt house. His last visit was actually on the day of the assassination, where he asked Mrs. Surratt to deliver a package to her Surrattsville, Maryland tavern to prepare a supply and to prepare a supply of guns and provisions which John Surratt Jr. had left there. Mrs. Surratt said okay, and then she delivered those packages to the Surrattsville and to John Lloyd, who was actually uh, a tenant and the tavern keeper in Mar and Surrattsville, to whom she informed that Booth would be stopping by that evening. On April 17th, actually, Major H.W. Uh, Smith and a party of soldiers arrived at the boarding house at 11 o'clock with orders to arrest all of the residents of this location. So it was about this time that a man came to the door, and he was actually carrying a pickaxe, um, claiming that there was, he was asking about a job to, um, about digging out a gutter or doing some work for Mrs. Surratt. And this man was actually Lewis Powell or Lewis Payne, one of Booth's conspirators. Asking, after asking Mrs. Surratt if she recognized the man and hearing what she had to say, uh, Morgan concluded that this man was lying and was indeed not who he said he was. So they proceeded to arrest Powell, who surrendered without protest. For her role in the Lincoln assassination conspiracy, Mrs. Surratt became the first woman in American history to be executed. Next up will be Grover's Theater. Grover's Theater was Abraham Lincoln's favorite theater, actually. Lincoln would often travel to Grover's Theater, which was located in what most people would say was the bad part of town. Security for the president was very high when he traveled to this part of town. On the night of Lincoln's assassination, actually, his son Tad was present at Grover's Theater watching a perform performance of Aladdin's Magic Lamp. When news of the assassination reached Tad's chaperon, he brought Tad from Grover's Theater back to the White House. The Kirkwood House Hotel was another location associated with the assassination, and it was here on April 14, 1865, that John Wilkes Booth assigned George Atzerod to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson. The Kirkwood was a popular hotel at the time along Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Atzerod booked room 126, which is the room directly above Johnson's, planning to kill the Vice President with two Bowie knives and a single-shot revolver. But Atzerod couldn't muster up the courage to go to Johnson's room when 10 p.m. rolled around the assigned time. Instead, went to a saloon in hopes that some whiskey would boost his courage. From there, he went to the Pennsylvania House Saloon and drank until 2 in the morning, where he actually rented another room because he couldn't remember uh, drinking at the first place and having a room actually at the Kirkwood House. So Atzerod woke early in the morning with a, with a plan to rent a carriage and sneak out of, actually, sneak out of Washington, D.C. and head toward Rockville, Maryland. Although his plan failed, Atzerod was able to talk his way past the guards now patrolling the city limits and uh, retreated to his cousin's uh, farm in Germantown, Maryland. Atzerod aroused suspicion from several witnesses and a detective staying with his, uh, with his cousin in Maryland. The authorities searched Atzerod's room at the Kirkwood and found the weapons and a banknote belonging to John Wilkes Booth. The Kirkwood house was torn down after the Civil War and an office building now stands in that location. The Herndon House was a boarding house where Lewis Powell or Lewis Payne stayed. Booth met here with Powell, Adzerod, and David Harold to plan their assignments for that evening. Booth would kill the president and Adzerod would kill the vice president, Johnson. Payne would kill Secretary of State Seward and Harold would help Payne kill Seward and escape into Maryland. After he assassinated the president, Booth was racing through the city and headed for the Navy Yard Bridge across the Anacosta River. Arriving around 1040, between 1040 and 11 o'clock, he was initially barred from crossing uh, by Sergeant Silas Cobb as the bridge usually closed the traffic around 9 o'clock. Booth uh, informed Cobb that he was traveling at night to take advantage of the moonlight and Cobb let him pass. He was followed a few minutes later by Harold who was um, able to pa also able to get past Cobb. Harold was actually pursued by a guy by the name of John Fletcher who was a stable hand and accused Harold of stealing a horse. So Fletcher was told by Cobb that he could cross, but he couldn't get back across because they were actually closing the, the bridge. So Fletcher actually was really mad, and he turned around and later uh, told, a, told the, the detectives about the theft of the horse. And as a result, at 2 in the morning, uh, Jennifer Christopher Auger was alerted to two men fleeing south into Maryland. So he promptly sent a dispatch of the 13th New York Cavalry under Lieutenant David Dana in pursuit. So this photograph that you see here is of the Navy Yard Bridge, was taken on the Uniontown, Uniontown side of looking back toward Washington, D.C. So Booth would have crossed the bridge coming toward the camera position.
After crossing into Maryland, uh, Booth and his accomplices, David Harold, picked up the weapons that he had earlier sent to Surrattsville and Mary Surratt's tavern. So Booth and Harold arrived at the tavern around midnight, with Harold saying to Lloyd, Make haste, get those things. And Lloyd knew what things they meant. The fugitives took the field glasses, ammunition, one carbine, and a few swigs of whiskey and left after Booth told Lloyd, quote, I am pretty sure we have assassinated Lincoln and Secretary Seward. Around 4 a.m. on April 15th, they arrived at the house of Dr. Samuel Mudd, just north of Bryantown. Mudd proceeded to examine Booth and set his broken leg that he had sustained from jumping from the stage at Ford's Theater. There's also some speculation that uh, the a horse, um, Booth's horse, fell on him and broke his leg. So it depends on which story you let you hear. But uh, both of them, uh, Samuel Mudd actually set his leg and giving both men, placing both men in a bedroom, he uh, also made a crude pair of crutches it, for John Wilkes Booth. From there, we head down to the Bryantown Tavern, and this structure was used, was uh, actually constructed in 1815. And during the Civil War, it was actually James H. Montgomery operated the tavern and Lieutenant Dana commanding the detachment, which made, up, made its headquarters here on April 15, 1865. That morning, John Wilkes Booth and David Harold were only four miles away from them at the home of Samuel Mudd. The Bryantown Tavern was used as headquarters for this cavalry in their pursuit of the Lincoln conspirators. Later, on April 27, 1865, this tavern was briefly the headquarters of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. The military brought those whom they had thought were involved in the assassination plot, to Bryantown Tavern for questioning, including Samuel Mudd. Mudd was transferred from a prison in Washington, D.C. to a prison in Washington, D.C. from here once he was arrested. As you continue south, one stop that you might want to make is at St. Mary's Church. So you can see the gravesite of Dr. Mudd and his wife. Although Dr. M uh, Dr. Mudd and his wife Sarah Frances Dyer Mudd were actually members of another church during the Civil War, they frequently attended St. Mary's. And the church cemetery contains their graves and other um, Mudd and Dyer relatives. Next up is the Samuel Cox home. This is uh, where Rich Hill most likely used to be. And this is where Booth and Harold met with Sam Cox and Thomas Jones. Jones and Cox agreed to help the two criminals cross the Potomac River into Virginia. For the next several days, Booth and Harold would stay in a pine thicket not far from Rich Hill, and Thomas Jones would bring them food and other things such as the newspaper. Sam Cox and Thomas Jones both went to prison, but in weeks were released. Today, the house still stands, nestled back among the trees and surrounded by a clump of uh, some vegetation. It is a private residence and is not open for tours, but can be reviewed from the roadside. The pine thicket is still there today, although smaller than its original size. Cox had enlisted the help of Thomas A. Jones to get Booth and Harold across the river to Virginia, where it was assumed they would be safe. Thomas Jones, on the 20th of April, saw Union troops riding near the pine thicket where Booth and Harold were hiding. He ran and told them that the Union was on their tail and that they decided to enter Virginia via boat that Jones had. Jones lived in a nearby farm called Huckleberry. And it's, this home still stands today, although it is a, um, a Jesuit retreat house and can only be visited by appointment. After five days, Jones returned to the pine thicket and advised the fugitive that it was time for them to go. He urged them to leave their horses behind. And they traveled on foot by night three and a half miles down a series of hidden paths and roads to a marshy area near the outlet of Port Tobacco Creek on the Potomac, where Jones had a rowboat tied up. When Booth and Harold shoved off, the night was dark and the two men became disoriented while rowing. After more than an hour, they ended up back on the east bank of the Potomac in Maryland. From here, they sought out the home of a friend who refused to let them stay at his home. It was just too dangerous and they were banished to the woods. After two more days of hiding out, and Harold again attempted crossing and finally landed in Virginia on the morning of April 23rd, nine days after the assassination. The Hughes farm was somewhere close to the area, right next to this area, um, but it is no longer standing. After rowing the wrong direction, the two assassins stopped at a friend's house of David Harold's. The farmer led them to his son-in-law, Colonel John J. Hughes, who provided the fugitives with food and a hideout until nightfall for a second attempt to row the river in Virginia. Booth wrote in his diary, quote, With every man's hand against me, I am here in despair. And why? For doing what Brutus was honored for. And yet... I, for striking down a greater tyrant than they had ever knew, I am looked upon as a common cutthroat. I'm going to zoom out here for a second. If you start to see how far 
John Wilkes Booth had to go to cross the river. They had to deal with currents. They had to deal with different things that were going on. So they tried to come down, come down here, and they ended up misguided. It was dark. So they actually ended up in the wrong spot. But you can see the distance. If you take a ruler, you can actually see, even if they were to do a short route, you know, it's almost two miles across. To get to this point, you know, you're looking at several miles across, um, almost six miles that they were in the water. So just to be able to get them to, um, to get across the Potomac River was a lot of work for them. So our next stop is the Queensbury House. Early in the morning of the 23rd, they, they finally managed to cross the Potomac River and get into Virginia. It was the second attempt that the two men had made the, made the cross. They departed the Maryland shores the first time the guide directed them pair to the McCaddock Creek and stated, quote, Mrs. Queens, Queensbury lives uh, near the mouth of this creek. If you tell her you come from me, I think she will take care of you. So Mrs. Queensbury helped uh, Booth and Harold by giving them food and, best of all, horses. She had done this because of Booth's broken leg. She arranged for Booth and Harold to be escorted to Virginia Plantation House 12 miles inland. The house was called Claydale after the ancestral Scottish home of its occupants, Dr. and Mrs. Richard Stewart. Dr. Stewart grudgingly allowed Booth and Harold to eat dinner in his home but then sent them on their way, refusing to treat Booth's leg. Booth was stunned at the way he was being treated. He had expected to be celebrated as a hero in Virginia, but instead was being treated as a criminal. Dr. Stewart, who wouldn't allow Booth and Harold to stay with him, led them to a freed slave, William Lucas. Lucas didn't want them to stay, but Booth took over the house and actually forced Lucas and his family to sleep outside. In the morning, Lucas's son Charlie transported the fugitives by wagon to the town of Port Conway on the Rappahannock River. He left them in the company of William Rollins, a fisherman who agreed to ferry them across, but not until he put out his fishing nets. While they were waiting for Rollins, Booth and Harold were spotted by three mounted soldiers. Fortunately for them, they were Confederate soldiers and on their way home after the war. Booth and Harold fell in with the soldiers, and they crossed the river together. The Rollins house is not standing any longer. While waiting, they met the former Confederate soldiers, including Private William Jett. In talking with Jet, Harold first identified himself as Boyd, and then that his companion was actually his brother, but James W. Boyd, instead of John Wilkes Booth, J.W. Boyd, get it. Um, he continued to talk, and Harold admitted that their true identities, that they had uh, killed the president. After hearing this, Jet agreed to aid the fugitives in securing lodging once they had crossed the river. Once they reached the south bank, Jet sought odd beds at the house of uh, Randolph Peyton in Port Royal, and he refused. He decided to take Booth and Harold around uh, south toward Bowling Green with the goal of finding lodging at the Garrett family farm. Arriving at the Garrett farm, Jet introduced Booth as Boyd, and Garrett agreed to let Boyd stay the night until Jet returned for him. Harold remained with Jet, and the party continued on to Bowling Green. On April 26, the Garrett farm became the last stop uh, for Booth and Harold. The Garrett farm was no longer is no longer standing, but there is a sign at the location commemorating what happened there. Booth and Harold slept at the Garrett farm for two days because the Booth lied and said that he was a Confederate soldier running from Union troops. Eventually, the Union soldiers found out where Booth was and cornered him at the Garrett's tobacco barn. Harold came out and gave himself up, but Boot, Boot, uh, Booth <laughs> didn't budge. He had a rifle in one hand and a pistol in the other, and it was clear that he wasn't going down without a fight. So around 4 a.m., they set fire. the Union troops set fire to the barn, and Booth challenged Union soldiers to a fight, but they didn't want to bring out uh, bring any harm to any soldiers. So a Union soldier, Boston Corbett, watched Booth's every move and had no idea. So just as Booth had begun to fire his pistol at, at the soldiers, Corbett looked through the sights and fired one shot. The bullet pierced the spine, paralyzing Booth. He was dragged from the burning barn, and he died shortly after dawn on April 26, 1865. Booth's body and Harold were taken to Washington that night and later transferred to the USS Montauk, which was anchored off the Washington Navy Yard. The 12-day manhunt was actually over. So I thought what I would also do is, in addition to these stops, is give you some locations of some other sites that you might want to visit. Let's start with the home of Henry Rathbone. Henry, Henry Rathbone's house was actually, is actually located at 712 Jackson Place. So Major Henry Rathbone was invited to view Our American Cousin with the President, Mrs. Lincoln, 
and his fiance Clara Harris were invited at the president's request when no substitute for General and Mrs. Grant uh, could be found for the occasion. Although Clara and Henry would eventually marry in 1867, the events of that night forever scarred Henry, resulting in the eventual murder of, of uh, his wife while serving as a U.S. consul to Hanover and very nearly killing his own children. Rathbone would eventually spend the last 28 years of his life in, in an insane asylum, forever devastated from the assassination of his dear president. So this house was purchased by the Rathbones in 1869, and they lived there until 1882, when Rathbone died on August 14, 1911. Today, the Rathbone House is the home to the Harry S. Truman Scholarship Foundation. On the night of April 14, 1865, the first assassination attempt to be carried out was that of uh, Secretary Stewart by Lewis Power, Lewis Payne, a co-conspirator of Booth. William Seward had recently uh, been in a carriage accident and suffered from numerous injuries from a broken jaw to a broken arm. It was about 10 p.m. and Powell approached the door and knocked and then met uh, William Bell, the Seward's butler. Creating a reason for being present, Powell claimed that he had medicine from Dr. Verity to deliver to the secretary. It needed to be delivered personally. The butler uh, was suspicious and wasn't sure if he should gain this stranger access to Powell got through anyway. Powell then made his way up the stairs and met Frederick Stewart, William Stewart's assistant secretary. The assassin repeated the same story that he had just told William Bell, but Frederick became suspicious and claimed that his father was sleeping. Fanny, the Secretary of State's daughter, appeared from what looked like a bedroom. Hearing voices, she looked outside the room and said, father, Fred, father is now awake. And then returning inside, giving her father's position and what room Powell had to go to, well, where the secretary was. The assassin suddenly pulled out his revolver and pointed it at Frederick. He shot at him, but the gun misfired. Frederick fell to the ground, and Powell approached the stunned assistant secretary of state and beat him repeatedly with the end of his revolver. Powell then made his way up to Stewart's bedroom and began stabbing the secretary of state with his bowie knife. With repeated blows to the face, William Stewart fell to the ground off his bed in an effort to stay alive. George Robinson and Augustus Seward ran into the room to confront the assassin, but Powell was able to escape past them, inflicting pain and injuries on both men. Seward may have looked in a bad condition, but would later survive the attack. The Seward house would become a symbol of major conspiracy that shocked the nation and killed one of the best presidents of today, Abraham Lincoln. Today, the site of the home of William Seward is occupied by the United States Court of Appeals. Next stop is the home of Gideon Wells, because late on the evening of April 14th, Secretary Wells uh, was visited by a courier informing him of the assassination attempts being made on Secretary Seward. Being a friend, Wells rushed to the home and found the news to be true. But upon arrival, Wells quickly determined that there was nothing that he could actually do for his friend and went instead to Ford's Theater only to discover that there was truth to the fact that Lincoln had also been assassinated. Wells soon came upon a mob in the street of Ford's Theater and fighting his way into the Peterson house, Lincoln found, uh, he, Wells found Lincoln uh, lying on a bed in a small bedroom. Wells wrote in his diary that, quote, the giant sufferer lay extended diagonally across the bed, which was not long enough for him. He had been stripped of his clothes, and his large arms, which were occasionally exposed, were of a size of which he would scarce have expected from this spare appearance. His slow, full respiration lifted the clothes with each breath that he took. His features were calm and striking. I had never seen him th them appear to be better advantaged than for the first hour, perhaps, that I was there. Wells wrote in his diary of the grief and the immediately struck the, all of those present, especially Mary and Robert Lincoln. While Mary had openly grieved throughout the night, Wells noted that Robert broke down in tears only twice during the last moments that his father had on earth. Wells was one of the few witnesses to the last moments of Lincoln, and after serving him well in life, he served him in death also, writing of the momentous occasion in respectful, in, in respectful ways. Today, the site of Gideon Wells' home is occupied by the Hayes at Hay Adams Hotel. While carrying a president across the street to Ford's Theater, the voice was heard over the crowd. Bring him in here. The voice belonged to Henry Safford, who was a boarder inside the home of William Peterson. So Dr. Leal and Lincoln's carriers charged back for the Peterson house. Once inside, the president was taken to a small room in the very back of the house, where they laid the president on the bed diagonally, seeing if he was too tall to fit straight. Immediately, the president was stripped so that Dr. Leal could do a full examination. Lincoln's only wound was the gunshot to the back of the head, and it covered... They, they actually covered him in a mustard plaster to keep him warm and wrapped him in a blanket and finally let Mrs. Lincoln see her dying husband. 
Soon Secretary of War um, Edward Edwin Stanton arrived and immediately set up office in the parlor and began to interview witnesses. According to a veteran employed to take notes, within 15 minutes, Stanton had enough evidence to hang John Wilkes Booth for the assassination of the president. Throughout the night, many of Lincoln's family and friends came to see the president. Lincoln's son, Robert, uh, just home from war, was brought from the White House and stayed by his side to comfort his mother. Lincoln's family physician, Robert King Stone, and Lincoln's pastor, Reverend Dr. Phineas Gurley, were both sent for and stayed the whole night. At one point, Mrs. Lincoln asked for her son, Tad, to be brought to the house. She had the vain hopes that perhaps hearing his son's voice, President Lincoln, would be brought back to consciousness. Lincoln, however, never woke up. And at 7.20 a.m., Dr. Leo placed his fingers over his pulse and waited for the president to draw his last breath. At 7.20 a.m., Lincoln took his last breath, and at 7.22, his heart stopped beating. Everyone bowed their heads, and Reverend Gurley said a prayer that later on nobody in the room was able to recall because it was so touching. And then Secretary Stanton said the now famous words, Now he belongs to the ages. Slowly, the back of the room of the Peterson House emptied and the arrangements for the president's body to be returned to the White House. They found a simple pine casket and carried it to the Peterson House, taking it in the back room for the house and set it on the floor next to the bed, where they wrapped the Lincoln's body in an American flag, which was still adorned with 36 stars. He was put in the pine casket and the lid was nailed shut and he was carried back out of the Peterson House to a waiting carriage. On July 7, 1865, four of Lincoln's assassination conspirators, David Harold, Lewis Powell, or Lewis Payne, Mary Surratt, and David Atzerud, were executed for their roles in the plot. Four other conspirators, Samuel Mudd, Ned Spangler, Samuel Arnold, and Michael O'Loughlin, were sentenced to prison terms. Today, the site of the execution uh, site at the old Arsenal prison was actually occupied by the tennis courts of Fort Leslie J. McNair. And our last stop today is going to be the Willards Hotel. Ever since Henry Willard purchased the hotel in 1850, it's been a center of Washington, D.C. politics, news, and important guests. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was actually smuggled into the hotel to avoid assassinata- assassination attempts in Baltimore and stayed there for 10 nights because he had not yet delivered his inaugural address and could not move into the White House. The bill for his stay for those 10 days was $773. Every president from Franklin Pierce to, B- to Barack Obama has actually stayed or attended, at, attended an event at the Willard Hotel. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous I Have a Dream speech here in the night before delivering it. The term lobbyist actually comes from uh, General Grant's years when Grant was president and he tra- would come to the Willard trying to avoid the pressures of politics. He would escape for a cigar from the, to the Willard lobby where people found him and would try to persuade him on individual causes. There's also another fun fact that in 1870s, the Willard Hotel sold the first ice cream soda in Washington, D.C. So I hope you enjoyed this little tour of the assassination and the pursuit of Lincoln's. I'll make this, uh, I'll make the KMZ file for the Google Earth available to you. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email. Check me out over at teachthecivilwar.com.